دكتور نمارك الجركي دكتور نمارك graduated of Kuwait Board of Neurology دكتور الجركي had her fellowship in neuroimmunology and multiple sclerosis from University of Toronto she is MS specialist at Mubarak Al-Kabir Hospital please welcome دكتور نمارك Good morning. Thank you for the invitation and organizing such a great meeting. I will be talking about MS and pregnancy. So MS is primarily diagnosed in women of reproductive age. MS disease and symptoms are tied to hormonal changes. I will start with a question. Is fertility affected by MS? Well, there are certain risk factors that may affect fertility uh, in MS patients. Autoimmune disease potential effect on fertility, as I will be discussing the anti-malarian hormone. Anti-malarian hormone is a uh, factor that reflects the ovaries reserve. Uh, there is evidence uh, that it is affected in many of the autoimmune cases. However, there is no sufficient data to support the association of reduced anti-malarian hormones uh, in MS patient to compare to, uh, comparing to healthy controls. Other factors may affect fertility symptoms, spinal cord lesions, sexual dysfunction and fatigue, decision to conceive and the fear of that MS might be transmitted to children, in addition to older therapies such as uh, metoxantron and cyclophosphamide. So relapsing remitting MS patients, long-term pregnancy does not worsen the prognosis uh, we, we should encourage women to have children if they wish as relapses during pregnancy or post postpartum period has no uh, effect on the long-term prognosis. What are the risk factors that can lead to postpartum relapse, higher disease activity in one to two year preconception, relapses in a pregnancy, disability at a pregnancy onset and longer washout from uh, highly DMTs? We all know that female to male ratio of developing MS is a three to one. It's even four to one in some Northern countries such as US and Canada. And then we know also that a pregnancy is a protective against uh, MS and relapses. The rationale is that the hormones, they have bimodal effect on MS. At normal or low level of hormones, even if the patient is taking birth control pills, this is not considered protective against MS. However, high level of hormones, as we can see, peak of hormones, estrogen, including estriol, estradiol, and the progesterone level, the peak and high level of hormones is a protective against MS and relapses. And then postpartum, we can see the dip or reduction in the hormones which puts the patient at a higher risk of postpartum relapses. So uh, in uh, an experimental autoimmune studies with mice induced with a, a peptide of myelin protein, it was noticed that estriol and estradiol ameliorated experimental autoimmune encephalitis severity uh, comparing with the placebo. And it was, it's important to mention that it was dose response, higher doses were more protective as explained uh, previously that a pregnancy because of a higher level of hormones is considered protective. And postpartum there's decline in the hormone. Uh, 
Now, there is evidence that exclusive breastfeeding for two to three months can protect uh, from MS relapses postpartum. However, briefly or combined, there's no evidence to support this, uh, that it is a protective from postpartum. So we advise our patient to exclusively breastfeed at least two months to, uh, to be protective from uh, relapses. Now let's discuss this study that showed that there's evidence of a clinical and radiological activity in pregnancy and postpartum. Uh, basically, this uh, explains the annualized relapse rate in the period of preconception, comparing it to pregnancy. It's about 0.33 uh, in the year before pregnancy, as we can see a reduction in annu uh, annualized relapse rate up to 0.1 in uh, pregnancy and there is again peak post uh, pregnancy in the postpartum uh, period and then it goes down again to pre-pregnancy state. Um, and there's also postpartum, there's not only clinical activity, it is also associated with radiological activity. Postpartum, there 50% of the pregnancy showed a new T2 lesions compared with 30% in a previous year. Not only T2 new lesion, but there's also GAD enhancing lesion, 30% compared to 25% uh, one year before getting pregnancy. And this is the number showing here. Postpartum, 40% of the MRI showing new T2 lesion and 27 showing gadolinium enhancing lesion. Now, it is important to counsel the patient, discuss the, uh, the pregnancy plan, discuss the high uh, whether the patient need high efficacious medication versus modest efficacious, depending on the case and the disease activity. And you might consider doing MRI preconception and then follow up in the first trimester and then again in the third trimester. And uh, postpartum follow-up, you might consider also repeating an MRI, uh, depend definitely on the scenario. So preconception counseling should include uh, the type of the contraception and the patient needs to be on effective contraceptive method before considering conceiving, uh, planning for a pregnancy, consider disease activity, a disability and DMT. It's important that uh, uh, for the patient in order to conceive, the disease has to be controlled at least one year before considering conceiving and definitely answering the patient to questions and fear uh, from the patient perspective point of view. The usual caretaking, folic acid, vitamin D, avoid active and passive smoking. It is uh, strongly recommended to suggest fertility consult uh, consultation if no pregnancy despite six months of attempting. Um, is there a risk of relapses with assisted reproductive technology? Yes, there are certain protocols, especially with repeated unsuccessful cycles. This put the patient at a higher risk of relapses. Uh, there are different types of protocols for ART. Those associated with gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists appear to be associated with a higher risk of relapse. So the antagonist based protocol is recommended if possible. And uh, the relapses, uh, we don't only blame the uh, ART uh, for the uh, relapses, it might be also due to DMT interruption or repeated pregnancy loss. Uh, women might need DMTs during prolonged fertility treatments. Uh, and in such cases, we can, uh, the patient can start the patient on glatiramir acetate or interferon beta or for high effective treatments such as rituximab. Rituximab has been used to achieve a pregnancy in women with recurrent miscarriage and antiphospholipid syndrome. Don't be surprised to see mild cases of MS. Their mild MS disease activity and they are being untreated before, during and postpartum period. Uh, those mild cases of MS, they have little or no disability, and frequent relapses, low lesion burden load on MRI, require modestly effective DMT to control the disease actively previously. There's no worry to tell the patient if she had mild disease activity, whether it's a clinically or radiologically, to conceive without uh, medication. As I mentioned earlier, it's important to achieve disease uh, stability before conceiving one year or even two years if it was unstable. 
it's important to consider the risk of relapse with natalizumab and fingolimod re uh, rebound. Uh, as I mentioned, pregnancy might be protective against uh, relapses uh, of MS. However, it might not be protected with natalizumab or fingolimod rebound especially if there's no assumption of DMTs one month postpartum. Uh, this is study showing or comparing uh, annualized relapse rate uh, postpartum uh, after rituximab suspension and natalizumab, and it showed that um, uh, annualized relapse rate was lower in the rituximab group comparing to the natalizumab, and rituximab provide long-acting protection against MX activity during pregnancy and postpartum. So let's discuss a case, 26-year-old female relapsing remitting. Previously, she was on uh, interferon uh, with the clinical and radiological activity. She was shifted to natalizumab. She was stable on it for two years. She became accidentally pregnant, so it was stopped. Uh, last dose, 10 weeks of gestation. Uh, during second trimester, four and a half months from the last dose of natalizumab, she got significant relapse, leg weakness, she used a cane, it was treated with the pulse steroid with some improvement. And then at early third trimester, she had another relapse, optic neuritis treated with complete uh, resolution, treated with pulse steroid. This is an MRI showing that the first uh, pre- this is a pre-pregnancy MRI during pregnancy. Sorry, this is a one month post uh, one month post pregnancy showing an increase and then high load in the legion, increased burden load in the brain. And this is ten month. We don't we see that she did not recover to baseline. So this is the effect. Don't underestimate the natalizumab or fingolimod uh, rebound. So it's important to manage this patient. This is also showing annualized relapse rate comparing natalizumab to rituximab and untreated patients, the lowest relapse rate among all of them uh, during pregnancy, and then it goes high for natalizumab, higher than the ba baseline pre-pregnancy state, and the lowest among uh, rituximab group. So what can we offer for patients that are already on fingolimod or natalizumab? We can switch to rituximab before conception uh, to prevent rebound disease activity and minimize, the, we should also consider minimizing risk to child. Uh, I will go through this in details. So there are certain factors to consider when counseling or dealing with patients who wants to conceive whether she is on DMT or not, um, considering whether the disease is active or not, whether is she is on effective on oral contraceptive while on she is uh, on a medication that carry higher risk of teratogenicity, and whether she is on modestly effective or high effective medication. Let's have a look about the uh, uh, compatible with lactation, as we can see, glatinamir and interferon beta, you can study that uh, recent data showing that the patients can have interferon beta uh, while lactating. With regard to natalizumab and rituximab, if needed, you always have to weigh the risk versus the benefit, whether to the patient and the child. And of course, the other orals, they are contraindicated to breastfeed because of trans, uh, they are transmitted in breast milk. Uh, let's discuss in details about the injectables. Now, for glatinamir acetate and interferon beta, they can be safely continued to conception and stopped at positive pregnancy test could consider use throughout a pregnancy. Both of them considered safe uh, in a pregnancy. Uh, you can use it if it's safe to the mother and the benefits outweigh the risk to the fetus. And this is a study showing uh, that in 1,022 cases, exposure to subcutaneous interferon beta during pregnancy were retrieved. Uh, it's concluded that you can consider it as an option interferon beta uh, during pregnancy and lactation period. No orals, most of the orals, uh, you have to stop it before pregnancy. It definitely depends on the washout period for HDMT. 
uh, for dimethyl fumarate, you can stop with contraception or with positive pregnancy test because of a short half-life. There is actually data on number of a pregnancy that got pregnant and get exposed to dimethyl fumarate in the first trimester uh, with no major side effect and no teratogenic effect. So it's considered relatively safe. Uh, Fingalimod, stop it two months before conception, be aware of the rebound. Sipanimod, 10 days before conception, because Fingalimod and Sipanimod, they basically differ at the molecular level, being Sipanimod more selective, that's why it's, it's had basically less um, washout period. Now, cladribine, last dose six months before conception, cladribine is also a good option for those with active MS that are on um, natalizumab and fingalimod. As you can see, to, uh, you can use the course of a pain in two years and uh, she can um, conceive six months from the last dose. Uh, Teriflunamide accelerated elimination protocol level needs to be less than 0.02 milligram per liter. Infusions, anti-CD20, uh, it's important to consider the time infusion for pregnancy. We can use it as a bridge. Um, with regard to alemtuzumab, last dose four months before conception, um, be cautious with the rebound caution in atalizumab, can stop with a pregnancy positive test, but with the risk of reactivation, you can continue natalizumab. We'll be discussing this later in details. A uh, better option, we can change to depleting agent before pregnancy. You can continue every six or eight weeks until 30 weeks of gestation. Be aware of the hematological abnormalities in neonate, pancytopenia, thrombocytopenia, and etc. Now let's talk about the B-cell depleting agent. Now, the average half-life for rituximab is 18 days, and for acrylizumab, it's 26 days. Uh, what's good about the uh, rituximab or those monoclonal antibodies is that their biological effect lasts longer than their half-life, much longer than the half-life. And we all know that uh, for monoclonal antibody, it takes about five half-lives for total elimination. For rituximab, it's three months. For ocrelizumab, it's four and a half months. Um, those IgG1 antibody do not cross placenta in the first trimester of a pregnancy, which is reassuring. Uh, now, FDA approves for ocrelizumab use one year post infusion. It doesn't have much rationale, as uh, since because of uh, you can start uh, the patient can start conceive one month later because during the first three months to second uh, trimester of a pregnancy, there will not be transmission through the placenta. They transport in a linear fashion, largest amount transferred in the third trimester. Uh, as I mentioned, biological effect lasts longer. Uh, can be used for bridging last dose four to six weeks before conception, considering that they will not, they will not cross the placenta until after the first trimester, which is reassuring. Uh, and this is a study showing the uh, rituximab use before, during, and pregnancy. This is the data. I will focus on the case series with 11 pregnancies. One was ongoing in 10 women, 7 MS, and 3 NMO. All had term life birth of healthy newborns. No maternal relapses before or during pregnancy. One relapse postpartum with an NMO. So this is reassuring that rituximab is potent and effective and protected and um, uh, considered a safe treatment uh, for patients with MS in pregnancy. And this data, again, uh, another study showing a pre-pregnancy use of rituximab. Uh, and this is study 27%, sorry, 27% women, they have a spontaneous abortion. There were no increased adverse effect in the pregnancy outcome, little disease activity in rituximab treated women uh, with MS. To summarize, many women with MS do not require DMTs during pregnancy. Injectables could be continued during pregnancy. Uh, women with highly active MS, cell depleting therapy could be given before conception. Uh, natalizumab could be continued through pregnancy till 30 weeks of gestation with monitoring the fetus. Women should be encouraged to breastfeed exclusively two to three months. Uh, if a brief a breastfeed or combined with formula, there is no sufficient data that this is a protective. Those with higher relapse, relapse risk consider injectables or monoclonal antibodies while breastfeeding. And I will end my presentation here. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Dr. Namarek, for this excellent presentation. Really, this hot topic, most of our patients, females and in the productive age. Thank you.